para la Cátedra de Estudios de África y el Caribe y la sección de Historia Mundial de la Escuela de Historia es realmente un gran placer contar con la presencia hoy del doctor Paul Lovejoy, quien es eh, distin profesor distinguido de investigación del Departamento de Historia de la Universidad de York. Además, tiene eh, el puesto de Canada Research and African Diaspora History y eh, ha sido también becado por la Royal Society of Canada. Tiene además el puesto de director fundador del Instituto Harry Truman para la investigación en África y sus diásporas. Además fue miembro del de proyecto de la UNESCO llamado La Ruta del Esclavo. Ha publicado más de 25 libros, entre ellos el clásico Transformations and Slavery, que tenemos la esperanza de que salga publicado al español muy pronto, gracias al esfuerzo de la cátedra. Eh, y es coeditor de African Economic History. Además tiene un, un eh, doctorado honorario de la Universidad de Sterling y en el 2009 recibió el premio del presidente, el premio de mérito del presidente de la York University. Y eh, tiene varios otros premios. Realmente eh, estamos ante un investigador que ha dedicado muchos años a la historia de África y que tiene una carrera muy distinguida en este campo. Próximamente tiene dos libros que van a salir publicados próximamente. El primero se llama Jihad and Slavery in West Africa During the Age of Revolutions. Y el segundo, Equiano's World, a Biography of Abolitionist Gustavus Vasa. Entonces realmente es una persona que ha establecido muchas de las tendencias, muchas de las innovaciones sobre el estudio de la historia de África. Así que es realmente para un eh, verdadero placer tenerlo acá. Eh, hoy nos va a hablar de la historia atlántica y la diáspora africana, la problemática de la historia cruzada o entangled histories. Eh, sin más, le doy la palabra. Solo quiero asegurarme si necesitan traducción simultánea. Hay aparatitos en esta esquina del auditorio, por favor, este, para que si lo necesitan, vean el aparatito. ¿Otra cosa? Oh, pero otra cosa importante, eh, las preguntas se pueden hacer en español porque también el, eh, el profesor Locho va a tener traducción simultánea. Muchas gracias, Alejandro. And buenas noches. Uh, the first, I want to apologize for my absolute terrible Spanish. Um, normally, when I talk, I dance around on the floor and pretend I'm on stage. This evening, I actually will stay very close to my desk so that the translators have an opportunity, uh, they have the translation, they have the text, so that we stay close to what I really want to say. Um, moreover, I want you all to know that if anyone wants a copy of my text in English, unfortunately, afterwards, you please contact me by email and I will send you a call. So this is not a problem. If you don't understand something, you may not understand something after you read it. <laughs> Now, my talk is on Atlantic history in the African diaspora. And I want to examine the problematics of histoire procès, or in English entangled history. I don't know what this is in Spanish, but you will have this interpretation. This translation. Now, Atlantic history as a field of scholarly research 
and historical analysis is now established as a subfield of history, both in its global dimensions and in reference to people of African descent. Yet how are we to understand Islamic West Africa in the context of Islamic history? The Islamic dimension is ancient, dating back more than 1,000 years, well before uh, there was an Atlantic world, uh, which uh, which arguably only emerged in the 16th century. Yet by that time, there were beautiful mosques in West Africa, such as the one in Jenny that's pictured here, uh, centers of learning, such as the Sankori Mosque in Timbuktu, extensive writing in Arabic, including the art of calligraphy, and richly embroidered, locally produced textiles, as in the gowns that wealthy men wore. These representations of Islamic culture raise issues about how the so-called Atlantic world has been conceptualized. I have some conceptual and theoretical issues that I want to address here uh, before I get into the main body of my paper. Uh, and I put the individuals here on the, in the PowerPoint with their basic concept attached to them. Uh, sometimes, following the lead of Paul Gilroy, reference is even made to a black Atlantic. However, this paradigm has serious conceptual weaknesses. While the focus is on the Atlantic world, and I put that in quotations, this reference is usually to Western Europe and the Americas, including North America, the Caribbean, Brazil, and Hispanic America, but ironically, without reference to the continent of Africa, whose landmass helps to shape the Atlantic basin. In general, Africans only enter the discussion of the Atlantic world through their enslavement their transport to the Americas and their enslaved condition, and the impact of their descendants on the cultural, political, and social history of the Americas. The African origins, the transcontinental linkages, and the re resulting reverberations in Africa are too often ignored, trivialized, or generalized without the application of the rigorous methodologies of history the social sciences and cultural studies. My talk today is directed at the problem of omission and neglect in treating the place of West Africa in the reconstruction of global history, and specifically during the period of the late 18th century and early 19th century. The development of methodologies that have sometimes been, been referred to as partial perspectives, quote, unquote, in gender studies, and histoire profe or tangled histories in global studies offer a critique that can inform the study of the Atlantic world, but as yet have failed to do so. Donna Haraway identifies what she called, quote, the privilege of partial perspectives, end quote, which she claims is tied to situated knowledge, quote, end quote. That is, Haraway argues that specific knowledge is situated or located within a specific framework that shapes analysis. Each perspective, therefore, is only partial and does not incorporate other ways of examining data. Her approach suggests that scholarly interpretation and intellectual perspective is inevitably situated that is, it's located within a specific context and shaped by that context. Hence, the scholarship can privilege a European or a Eurocentric perspective and, and can discriminate on the basis of a gendered bias. Haraway advocates an analytical framework that does not focus on male-centered conceptions and by extension does not privilege European racialized, that is, white, or nationalist perspectives. Such an approach inevitably suggests that histories are complicated, which some scholars have referred to as entangled histories, or histoire procès. 
Uh, Michael Werner and Benedict Zimmerman have raised the challenge of what they call reflexivity in confronting this complication in historical interpretations. They argue that methodology has to transcend comparative history through pragmatic and reflective induction. Their methodology develops principles of reflection in understanding the entangled histories of societies and peoples. The approach of his law profet thereby confronts the partial perspectives of situated knowledge. An examination of the jihad movement in West Africa uh, during the so-called Age of Revolutions between the 1770s and 1840s provides a useful means of confronting issues of partial perspectives and entangled history. A uh, jihad referring to the Muslim conception of holy war uh, and the period in question uh, referring to what in European and American history of the Americas is referred to as the Age of Revolution. My study draws on both approaches to reveal problems with a historical paradigm that has largely overlooked Islamic West Africa in the study of slavery and emancipation in the broader Atlantic world. We can understand the problem by first exploring the revolutionary transformation of West Africa in the period after the 1770s when jihad, that is holy war, swept across the region. The leadership of this movement is perhaps best uh, represented by uh, Usman Damsodio, uh, whose name is on the board here, who was responsible for instigating the most successful jihad in 1804 that resulted in the creation of the state that was known as the Sokoto Caliphate. The Sokoto Caliphate, just for those of you who do not know African history, uh, with its creation after 1804, became the second largest Muslim state in the world after the Ottoman Empire. And most people do not know that this actually happened in the context of African history. Usman Danfodio, referred to as the Sheikh, or the Sheikh, uh, was associated with the mystical Sufi Brotherhood, or Tariqa, known as the Qadiriya, which dominated the Islamic world of West Africa in the 18th and 19th centuries. His son, Muhammad Bello, who was fully involved in the jihad and who succeeded to leadership as caliph, and caliph in Arabic means the successor. On the death of his father, Usman Danfolio, in 1817, ruled himself until 1835. And he wrote the most, one of the most important books of the jihad, which is known as the Fatwa Maksur, uh, in, in 1812, which chronicles the history of the movement up to the period of 1812 and justifies and explains why a holy war was necessary in West Africa. This book was one book of approximately 1,000 books and pamphlets and manuals that Usman Danfolio, his brother Abdullahi, his son Muhammad Bello, and his daughter Nana wrote in a period of about 30 years, 1,000 books. All of them were, almost all of them were written in Arabic, a few were written in Fulfolde, and a few were written in Hausa. The literary output of this family alone, and the many scholars who surrounded them, attest to the monumental intellectual ferment of the time, something that surely compared to the intellectual production of Europe during the Age of Revolution, but which is scarcely known. The Jihad movement resulted in the revolutionary transformation of West Africa during this period of global change, including the tremendous expansion of slavery on levels that were comparable to the so-called second slavery of Dale Homage in the Americas at the same time. And this is my final theoretical point. Uh, Dale Homage's uh, uh, conception of second slavery 
which explains in the context of the Americas why in the 19th century, when slavery was being attacked, attacked by British and abolitionists and so on, it expanded so rapidly in the United States, in Cuba, and in Brazil, and indeed elsewhere. An examination of the rise of the Sotheville Caliphate after 1804, which became the largest state in Africa since the collapse of Songhai in 1591-92, reveals that the history of West Africa has to be taken into consideration in understanding how partial, perspect partial perspectives situate knowledge. A Eurocentric approach suppresses or overlooks major historical changes and the extent to which entangled histories must account for conscious efforts to keep histories disentangled, and I will explain what I mean by this later, and separate. I would argue, for example, in the case of Muslim West Africa, there was a conscious effort in West Africa not to be part of the European world. That is not to be entangled. From the situated perspective of Islamic West Africa, there was no Atlantic world, but rather an Islamic world, and a commitment to holy war or jihad that attempted to maintain a level of autonomy from the European dominated Atlantic Basin, which restricted entanglement until the European conquest of Africa at the end of the 19th century. I refer uh, specifically to the Songhai Empire that collapsed in 1591-92 being the largest state in African history until the 19th century. And as you see here, it dominated virtually all of West Africa at the period in the 16th century when both Portugal and Spain were expanding into the Atlantic world. On another occasion, I talked in, in detail about how this area of West Africa was very strongly inter uh, 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 influenced by uh, the, what we know as the Iberian Peninsula, although what was known in the Muslim world as Andalusia. And the Andalusia dimension, which comes from the Iberian Peninsula, went across the Sahara, while the Iberian influence from the Iberian Peninsula went across the Atlantic. Now, the Jihad movement began in the Senegal River Valley in the late 17th century and resulted in the formation of the first Jihad states, the first Jihad state, Fouda Bantu, and subsequently spread to the highlands where the Niger and the Gambia rivers traced their origins, resulting in the formation of Fouda Jalon. After the 1770s in particular, the movement intensified with the continued expansion of Fouda Jalon and the establishment of a third uh, Jihad State in the Senegal, uh, Senegal River Valley, known as Futa Toro. As the name Futa indicates, all three of these Jihads had a common feature, besides the fact that they were revolutionary Muslim uh, uh, movements, which was the pre predominance of people who were known as Futa, or Fulbe, uh, and who were pastoralists, that is, cattle herders, and clerics, that is, Muslim scholars. And indeed, this ethnic dimension was to continue into the 19th century and was an important feature of this, uh, of this uh, uh, jihad movement. As indicated, the Zogato Caliphate, under the dynamic leadership of Usman Dampolio, his brother and his son, was particularly successful, overthrowing virtually all of the uh, established uh, governments of what is now Niger and the northern two-thirds of Nigeria, northern Cameroon, as far from Burkina Faso all the way to the Central African Republic. I don't show the modern um, boundaries of these countries on this map, but you can roughly visualize that this is a very significant part of West Africa. Uh, the Caliphate eventually comprised 33 emirates, and had twin capitals at Sokoto and Guantu. The impact, and this is an example of the military uh, force that conquered this whole region in the name of Islam and the name of Jihad. 
an area that was already heavily Muslim, but was in, Muslim, was in Islam that was in, uh, in the need of reform and revolutionary action as far as the jihad leaders were concerned. And what it created was a state that took over this region and created this, the Sopato Caliphate. Uh, the impact can be seen graphically with reference to these two maps that show the region of Nigeria in the late 18th century, the same region several decades later. And this is an area, of course, that today is extremely um, uh, uh, Muslim. Um, and as you will hear at the end of the, my talk, too, also an area where jihad continues in the form of Boko Haram. By the middle of the 19th century, the Sokoto Caliphate was larger than any state in Africa since the fall of Songhai, and it was the largest state in Africa in the 19th century. Indeed, in the Islamic world, only the Ottoman Empire was larger in size and population. Moreover, the Sokoto Jihad had reverberations that further transformed other parts of West Africa and areas as far east uh, as the Nilotic Sudan and the shores of the Red Sea. By the middle of the 19th century, the various Jihad states, including the Sokoto Caliphate, stretched from the Atlantic coast in Senegambia, uh, where the Gambia and Senegal rivers flow into, which are modern Senegal, Gambia, and Guinea, all the way into, to the Red Sea and the, country, the modern country of Sudan. And extended indeed across the Holy Lands as far as the Hijaz, which is the area where the, the Muslim Holy, uh, Holy Lands are, which is where Mecca and Medina are located. The maps show very clearly two major transformations that resulted from the consolidation of the Sultan Caliphate. First was a class. Do you need to show them up here, maybe? What do we want? In the, I think you need. You want to show another map. Oh, I have to, I'm doing the wrong one. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing it in front of me. So yeah. it's this. This is what's being transformed to this. Sorry about that. I'll put this aside. So the maps show very clearly two major transformations, and I will show. One, this major state, Oyo, and this major state, Borno, were, and Borno actually controlled all of this area so that these were dependencies that meant that this was the largest state and this was the largest state in the region, were completely, Oyo was completely destroyed, and Borno lost half of its territory in the course of the jihad. Um, now, Oyo had been the dominant state in the interior of the Bight of Benin, but suffered severely from an uprising in the military in 1817 that was connected to the Jihad and resulted in the complete collapse of Oyo in 1836, the destruction of the capital city and its heavily populated capital district. Here is where entangled histories can be discerned, because Oyo had been one of the major sources of enslaved Africans for the America from the end of the 17th century into the early 19th century. In short, Oyo, a Yoruba state, was very definitely part of the Atlantic world. With its destruction, its participation in the Atlantic world was altered dramatically. Instead of being the, the political instrument for the transfer of enslaved Africans to European ships, the citizens of the Oyo state became the principal victims of enslavement and correspondingly were associated with the forced migration of Europa-speaking peoples to Cuba and Bahia in particular in the 19th century, and therefore connect directly with Dale Thomas's The Second Slavery, because the expansion in Cuba and the expansion in Brazil were in part related to the destruction of Oyo in the course of jihad. The other major change was the collapse of Borno, which itself was a Muslim state uh, and was the other major state in the interior. Uh, and while Borno was able to survive the jihad, it did so through a radical change in the form of its own government, which in itself amounted to something comparable to a jihad. The ancient 
uh, Sefawa dynasty that had ruled Borno for 1,000 years was overthrown. A reform government was introduced under uh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad al kanemi uh, And the result of this was that it, the state was completely transformed. In the course of the jihad, the capital city of Borno was destroyed, as the capital of Borno was destroyed, and all the heavily populated area around it was completely destroyed, and virtually everyone either had to run and flee, or they were enslaved. The reformed government of Borno that survived under El Kanemi opposed the jihad, but nonetheless instituted reforms that made the surviving government very similar to the jihad state. And indeed, in the 1890s, the surviving state of Borno was overthrown in another jihad. So that in the end, it fell too uh, to the jihad. And Borno today, as you well might know if you follow uh, the history of Boko Haram, is where this, that movement, that, that Islamist terrorist, sometimes called movement, uh, is located. In all of these cases, jihad was closely associated with the intellectual renaissance conveyed in the writings of the jihad leadership. The movement also resulted in the implementation of Islamic law in the form of the Sharia, the spread of schools, and the building of mosques. The impact demographically uh, could be seen with the founding of numerous towns and cities which replaced and superseded the former capitals of Oyo and Borno. The, the region, and this is not normally known but except by specialists in African history, the region was already heavily urbanized. It's a feature of African history which is not often appreciated. But the extent of urbanization in the 19th century greatly accelerated. Urban areas were easy to identify because they were all walled towns. They were all towns that were surrounded by walls. They all had central markets. They all had Friday mosques. They all had palaces. They all had schools. They all had living quarters that were organized, organized on the basis of economic specialization. Cano, uh, for example, uh, and this is a drawing from the 1850s, uh, had been a city state under Bourneau before the Jihad. But it emerged under the Sophocle Caliphate, as the largest city of the Caliphate, uh, with an estimated uh, rainy season population of about 50,000 uh, people. During the dry season, more people were in the city because they came in from the countryside. And within a 40-kilometer 40 40 radius of the city were another 40 walled towns and numerous villages, plantations that were worked by enslaved laborers, um, uh, and industrial establishments, uh, which were truly astonishing. Here is an, uh, a, a picture in the late 19th century of the walls of Khan, just to give you an example. Uh, this is the interior of one of the mosques that were, that, that, uh, were built in the caliphate. This is the one in the Emirate of Zaria in particular, uh, showing the internal decoration of the mosque. Um, one of the most significant economic developments was the great expansion in the production of textiles from both grown cotton and a leather industry that made shoes, bags, cushions, rugs, equipment for horses and camels. The textile industry deserves some discussion. Cotton of an African variety was grown extensively, and the ginning of cotton, that is the removal of the seeds from the cotton fiber, and the state of threat were widespread. Both of these tasks were basically women's work. Textiles were often dyed, as you see here, the most common dye being indigo. In the area of Kano City and its hinterland, those 40 towns surrounding it, it's been estimated there were as many as 50,000 men engaged in the dyeing of cloth. This is a real industry. The only thing that makes Cloth was dyed in these large pits. These pits go down 20 meters, 25 meters into the ground. Um, some dyeing centers have as many as 100 to 200 dye pits. As you see here, there's a lot of dye pits. Um, you see this is indigo dye. These were factories. 
Although to outsiders, they may not look like factories because they didn't have roofs over there and they were not in buildings because they were all outside. But nonetheless, in terms of the scale of production, that's what we're talking about. The textiles not only were for a local consumption, but they actually, uh, the textiles were exported as far as North Africa, all across West Africa, not to Europe, although more recently in contemporary times, some tie-dye type cloth and stuff is reminiscent of the types, some of the types of, of, of textiles that are produced uh, in this region. The reason for this spectacular growth in textile production was because of the prevalence of slavery. Estimates made at the end of the 19th century and in the first decade of the 20th century provide some idea of the size of the slave population in West Africa. Perhaps 30 to 50 percent of the population of these Islamic states in the Western Sudan was enslaved, with percentage even higher near some of the commercial centers like Kano. The areas of the Western Sudan that included Fudijalong, Fudatoro, the Umarian state, and other areas of Muslim concentration had an estimated slave population in excess of 1.7 million in about 1900. These areas are designated historically in terms of French colonial terms of Abou Senegal, Niger, Guinea, Senegal, the area of modern Mali, and Niger. Uh, Guinea, and so on. The extent of slavery in the Sokoto Caliphate was roughly in the same proportions, about 25, probably as high as 50 percent of the total population, and certainly totaling um, many millions. Some measure of the size of the enslaved population can be gleaned from the reports from the middle of the 1890s through the first several decades of the 20th century. Uh, we don't have earlier estimates uh, for various reasons, of course. But when we know that at the end of the 19th century, during the period of the European conquest of the West, West Africa and all of these Muslim states, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of slaves ran away from their masters. And that has been documented, and it gives an example of the scale of the enslaved population. Most of the people who ran away went back to areas where they had come from, where their families had come from, uh, and uh, it was a major crisis at the time of the European uh, conquest. The population of the Sokoto Caliphate can't be determined with any accuracy, but based on early colonial tax assessments by the British uh, after 1900 and much guesswork, it appears that as many as 20 million people lived in the Sokoto Caliphate, with perhaps half of the total in the central, central emirates of Kano, Texas, and Azaria, and the capital districts of Sokoto and Guandu. Various independent estimates on the proportion of slaves in the Caliphate suggest that as much as many as 50 percent, and certainly as many as 25 percent of the population was servile. Uh, although the percentages of the enslaved population varied from emirate to emirate. Uh, by the end of the 19th century, for example, apparently most people in the Sokoto area, that is around the capital, were slaves. That is the majority of the population. And this pattern extended to Guangdu, the twin capital, which is not far away. Uh, the Kano, Zaria, Nupe, and Katsina emirates also had very large numbers of slaves while there were heavy concentrations in Bauchi, the Lawrence, the Tanko, and the various sub-emirates of Fombina, also known as Mali. Now, as you see here, these populations can be compared with the scale of slavery in Brazil, uh, in Cuba, and in the United States, at the height of the enslaved population statistics in these areas. And what we're seeing, in effect, is that the scale of slavery in both areas is roughly comparable. Uh, despite weakness of the demographic data, data, the scale of slavery in the Jihad states appears to have been roughly on the same level as the number of slaves in the Americas in the 19th century. That is, in the period that Dale Tomich has referred to as second slavery. 
and which I refer to in my forthcoming book and in other articles as applying the same concept, saying the idea of a second slavery also pertains to West Africa and the Islamic states in exactly the same period for completely different reasons. The large population of slaves is a general indication of the enormous size of the market for slaves which continued after the, ter of the termination of the transatlantic slave trade. The Sopico Caliphate probably had a slave population that matched that of Brazil at least, and probably was comparable to that of the United States in 1860. Cano Emirate alone uh, certainly had more slaves than Cuba in the middle of the 19th century. In terms of sheer numbers, therefore, the enslaved population of Islamic West Africa was of major proportions, and the market for enslaved individuals had to have been uh, on such a scale to have influenced both the transatlantic trade and the trans-Saharan trade from Western Africa. Moreover, it seems that adult females outnumbered adult males in the slave population in West Africa which thereby had an impact on the formation of such society accordingly. Demographic information collected by French colonial officials at the turn of the 20th century suggests that about 60% of adult slaves were actually females, while the sources behind this estimate are of varying degrees of reliability, there is no reason to question the overall impression that the scale of slavery was substantial. Given the scale of slavery, a, late, a related question concerns the demography of the traffic in enslaved Africans across the Atlantic, and why the Jihad movement was most influential in Bahia, and much so elsewhere in the Americas, although it was also influential in Cuba. As the size of the enslaved population in Islamic West Africa demonstrates, the incidence of enslavement in the course of jihad, in the course of holy war, was massive and affected not only those who were actually enslaved, but also many other people who were killed in the course of warfare and slave raiding or driven from their homes and forced into defensible but difficult areas in which to pack out of a, a, a living. It is virtually impossible to determine how many enslaved people were forcibly incorporated in the Jihad state or from where they all came. Nonetheless, the Americans too were designated Dambara to indicate that they were actually not Muslims, although they might have been in some cases. By far more important were the, were the people who were enslaved who left from the Bight of Benin ports, that is in modern southwestern Nigeria and uh, neighboring um, the Republic of Benin uh, as far as Ghana, um, and particularly from the ports of Wida, Port of Novo, Badakari, and by the early 19th century, increasingly from Lagos. After 1804, there were significant numbers of people who can be identified as Muslims because they were referred to by ethnic terms that implied that they were Muslims. And those terms were Hausa, Nupe, or Kappa, uh, Borno, that indicated Muslim allegiance. With the uprising at Imoran in 1817, Imoran was the military outpost for the oil empire, and most of the soldiers in that military for the oil empire were actually Muslims, uh, because the oil military was based on cavalry, and cavalry had horses, and the people who took care of horses were people from further north who were in fact were Muslims. And in, 18, in 1817, an uprising, almost a coup d'etat, uh, occurred in uh, Oyo, center of that uh, which ultimately resulted in the complete collapse of the Oyo state, and indeed the capital, as I indicated, of Oyo, uh, was abandoned in 1836, and the heavily populated area around it uh, was either enslaved or they migrated to new centers further south. And to this day, the area around what was the Oyo capital before 1836 is largely a wilderness. And as a result of the uprising in 1817 and the subsequent collapse of Oyo, uh, many tens of thousands of Yoruba-speaking people were deported to Cuba and Bahia. 
Uh, the significant number also ended up in Sierra Leone as a result of British anti-slavery activities uh, in intercepting slave ships. In both Cuba and Bahia, therefore, the jihad of Sokoto had a direct impact on the composition of the slave community. In both cases, Africans formed strong communities that were reflected in the formation of Canto Blanc in Bahia and Cabildos in Cuba that were recognized specifically as in Yoruba, although in Cuba they were called Lukumi and in Bahia they were called Napo. Uh, and in Sierra Leone, they were called Aku. Among many things, the, the name, the term Yoruba is an adaption for these people who speak the same language that only comes in in the 19th century. Uh, the term Yoruba is a Muslim term for these people. It's the term in Hausa, the term in Hausa is Yarabawa. It's a term that goes back to the writings of Akhman Baba, at least in 1614 in which these people who speak what we now recognize as Yoruba, uh, they speak a common language, they have a similar culture that's related to Orisha worship, and so on, that these people, uh, for very interesting reasons, uh, Christian missionaries, most of whom were Yoruba, that is, Africans, adopted the Muslim name for themselves. And that name is the name that we now know these people, Yoruba, not, not uh, how do you say it? Not say it? Uh, um, anyway, Yoruba is how you pronounce it. Uh, not Yoruba. That's it. Uh, in both, okay. Among the many conspiracies, revolts, and other political activities that occurred in both Cuba and in Bahia that were associated with Yoruba, the Mali uprising in Bahia in 1835 is the most noteworthy and was particularly prominent and was very definitely associated with Islam. Hence the regions of jihad in West Africa and the great expansion of slavery in the states that were formed from jihad were entangled with the areas of the Americas where second slavery was prominent, namely Cuba and Brazil, although not the United States, because the United States, of course, as you probably know, uh, stopped uh, the importation of enslaved Africans in 1807, um, although some, were, some people were brought in illegally after that, most of the expansion of slavery in the United States in the 19th century is a result of demographic expansion of the population in the United States, and specifically the sale of people from the old South, that is Virginia and South Carolina, into the new South, uh, that is Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, where cotton uh, uh, and other crops were, were grown extensively. So that the United States pattern is different from that of Cuba and Brazil. But Cuba and Brazil are strongly influenced by the jihad, as indeed is the history of Sierra Leone. The Muslim states did not want enslaved Africans sent to the Americas, but rather they wanted them to remain within the jihad uh, state. Uh, but nonetheless, we have to see that the concept of second slavery has a global application which alters its original intention considerably. We return, therefore, to entangled and disentangled history. Uh, and I can use as an example uh, one individual who I've been studying a lot recently. His name was Muhammad Ali Saeed, also known as Nicholas Saeed, uh, who had an extremely interesting odyssey. He didn't cross the Atlantic as a slave. He crossed. He was, his father was a, was a general in the foreign law under the Al-Kanemi regime. Uh, he happened to have been kidnapped by Tuareg uh, raiders. Uh, he went out with other teenage boys against the wishes of his mother, and he was kidnapped. And he was sold across the Sahara, not across the land. Uh, he was sold to a tobacco merchant in, in Tunis, uh, who actually took him on pilgrimage to Mecca. Unfortunately for the merchant in Tunis, the tobacco merchant, half of the market of Tunis burned down while he was in Mecca, and he lost all of his store and all of his wealth, and so he sold, um, he sold his very valuable slave, who was extremely well-educated, um, and who should have been ransomed and sent back to West Africa, but wasn't, that's another story. But he ultimately was bought by a prince from Russia, 
uh, a prince. Uh, we took him back to St. Petersburg, and who was, who was in fact became the commander in chief of the Russian forces in the Crimean War. And, and he then subsequently became uh, free in uh, St. Petersburg after he converted to um, uh, the Orthodox Church. Uh, he was taken by yet another prince all through Western Europe, uh, London, uh, where he decided he wanted to go back to West Africa, uh, and he was going to do that, except that he got employment with a Dutch, a wealthy Dutch planter from Suriname, uh, who was actually by this point an abolitionist, and took him to the Caribbean and to North America, and to make this very long story even shorter, our man, our hero, Muhammad Ali Saeed, Muhammad Saeed, enrolled in the Union Army, and became a sergeant in the 55th Massachusetts uh, Regiment, which was one of the several black, all-black regiments in North America, fought in the Civil War. And then wrote his autobiography, which was initially published in quite a famous journal, Atlantic Monthly, in, in, in 1867. Published a book, an autobiography of his accounts in 1873. Fell in love with a woman in South Carolina and didn't go home, instead had a family and died in Alabama in 1882. Now, this man did not cross the Atlantic as a slave, but he did cross the Atlantic with a level of political consciousness so that he fought in the Union Army to help free people and to end slavery. Or another individual, uh, Mohammed Kaba Sakadugu, uh, who became associated with the Moravian mission in Jamaica. Mohammed Kaba Sakadugo was enslaved about age 20 uh, on the borders of Fouti Jamon, one of the Jihad states that I talked about. He was on his way to Timbuktu to study law uh, when he was enslaved. He was sent to Jamaica in 1777. Uh, he, as, as obviously is clear, uh, he came from a very prominent family, a wealthy family. He said his father owned 200 slaves and operated a plantation uh, in the town of Buka, uh, which can be found, in, which exists today in uh, the Republic uh, of Guinea. Um, he ended up on a coffee state, a state uh, known as Spice Grove, uh, which still exists. Not as coffee in that state anymore. Now we only grow marijuana, as far as I can tell. But nonetheless, uh, it was a coffee state. And, and um, he lived there until his death in 1845. He was born a free man, brought up, uh, educated. Uh, he went through a long period of slavery, and he died a free man. Because after 1834, of course, people in the British Empire were emancipated. Um, he wrote an extremely interesting two, two books in Jamaica and Arabic um, about praying. Why he pray, when he pray, um, uh, what prayers mean, all of this. He wrote it. He says at the end of his first book, he says it because he says, I'm writing all this down because I'm losing my memory. He had no access to any Arabic manuscripts anymore, so he was writing entirely from what he could remember, from what he had learned before he was 20. Uh, or another individual, Mohammed Dardo Bakwa, which I've written, uh, published a book on, in which there's a lot of additional research going on. An extremely interesting uh, individual. His mother was Hausa from the Sofitel Caliphate. His father was Dende, probably of Moroccan origin, uh, who was taken to Rio de uh, was taken initially to Recife uh, in Brazil as a slave. Uh, the reason he was enslaved was because he was a uh, uh, late teenager and he was um, uh, involved in the palace. Uh, and he and his friends uh, uh, were harassing girls in, on the way to the march. And so some of the brothers and others of these girls who were being harassed, uh, this is his own admission, uh, they beat him up one night, got a drunk, beat him up, and then they sold him. Um, just to get rid of him, and they did, and he went to uh, Recife. He was sold to Rio de Janeiro, and then Rio Grande was sold. Um, he ended up, however, very lucky. Uh, his master stupidly took him on a ship full of coffee, Brazilian coffee, to New York, uh, New York City in 1847. And of course, in New York City in 1847, there was no more slavery. And so when he got there, he says his first word that he learned in English was freedom. And when he got to New York City, he was met by the local vigilante group 
of uh, blacks and abolitionists who got off the ship. They smuggled him to Boston. He was sent to Haiti for two years. He came back to the United States, wrote his autobiography, uh, a very interesting individual. And in all these cases, you do see histoire procès in Tangle's history. But you see it, and you do see partial perspective, because you see the story from the other side by people who are not slaves, but people who are individuals. So how are we to understand perspective? And what is meant by the distortions that can be introduced unintentionally? How did Muslims perceive their enslavement in Europe and the Americas? We've, I've referred to resistance, to uprisings, and so on. Um, uh, this is our, my hero from Bornholm. His father was a general. He went to Russia. This shows him in his union, union uh, uniform when he was a sergeant. This is often to show people who don't really know very much about Islam or know about Muslims, to, to show that you know Muslims, when they were in the Americas, they may become Christian. But you have to understand that what the Muslims were being taught in West Africa at this time, as children, is what happens to you if you become enslaved? What happens if you become enslaved to a Christian? When is it, when is it all right not to pray five times a day? How do you hide your religion? And you know one of the ways you hide your religion? By becoming a Christian. This shows Muslims are, uh, in Brazil. Uh, it shows very clearly their facial scarifications, their body markings, uh, which identify them, where they came from, who they were, and establish their free status. Establish who they were so that they could be ransomed if they did happen to be enslaved. And the last guy I mentioned, Mohammed Garba Kwakla, it's not a very good picture, but it's from the front speech of the book. Um, uh, by uh, a Baptist uh, missionary book. Um, and so what you see, these participants themselves, how did they interpret their actions? Did they see what they were doing as resistance and revolt? It's clear from the biographical material, and at this point in the project that I'm involved in, we have collected thousands of biographical accounts of people from West Africa in the 18th, 19th century. If you think there's no data about what was happening at that time, you're wrong. There's a lot of data. Again and again, without exception, the testimonies of participants, whenever they say what they were doing, they never, ever say they were in revolt. They never refer to what they were doing as an uprising. They never refer to what they were doing as resistance. You know what they call it? They call it war. They were at war. And they use specifically the term war. Because from their perspective, uh, and in the case of Bahia as well, the Mali Uprising of 1835, we don't know this, we're still trying to sift through the information to make sure, they may have actually even used the word in house of, which would have been the word, or Yoruba, which would have been the, the term they would have been saying, uh, a jihad or a jihadi in Hausa. Uh, so whether or not they were referring to jihad or not, they were not referring to resistance and uprising, which is the slave master, the colonial approach to understanding the agency of what people are doing. When we have the actual testimony of the people themselves, uh, we see that, what they, that the, what they thought they were doing is that they were fighting and they were involved in a war. And so what we're trying to do in terms of deciding whether or not they were referring to jihad specifically or more or generically is that we're trying to figure out uh, there are various uh, circumstantial information such as was there an imam in the community. If you have a jihad, you have to have an imam. You have to have a leader. You have to have somebody who leads in prayer. Uh, Bobo Haram has an imam as a leader, and he actually has his third one, because the first one was killed by the Nigerian police, the second one seems to have just recently been killed, and the third one has been appointed. One leader, an imam. Usman Dovifolio was considered an imam. 
so that you, you understand the importance of that. Also, we also see symbols of jihad, the use of flags, flags, white flags, the use of flags, who was responsible for that area, the use of silver rings. Silver rings are, a, are definitely meant as a Muslim signal that I'm a Muslim, you're a Muslim, we are involved in something together as part of the community. Because you can always hide the fact that you pray or don't. You can always hide the fact that you, you don't eat pork. You can always hide the fact that you don't drink. Uh, you can hide these things if you're fasting, which of course is one of the very important Muslim uh, rituals that lasts one month every year, the month of Ramadan. You can hide um, the fact that they would do fast or not. Muhammad Kabbalah Saganubu, for example, the Muslim in Jamaica, he reported how they hid fasting. They fasted. They were a Muslim community, even though they were going to the Moravian church. They were a Muslim community. They said, we lied. We told our pastors we were sick. We couldn't eat. And then when the sun went down, we ate. And then and this was the kind of thing. They got beaten, too, of course, because they were lying. But then it takes a lot to realize that people are lying if you are monitoring these situations. So we can't yet establish conclusively that the participants of the 1835 war in Bahia are considered a jihad, but most of them, no matter what, most of them who were involved have been strongly influenced by the Sultan of Caliphate, no doubt. And finally, in conclusion, well, that's, that's the itinerary of Muhammad Gar in Kwako, where he came from in Africa, where he went to America. He ended up in Liverpool, yet actually I think he ended up back in Nigeria. Uh, we're still trying to prove that fact, uh, but we haven't when I did this map. Uh, but it does show the Atlantic world from a different perspective, and it shows the entangled history from a different perspective. And finally, just to conclude, I want to just a, a couple of words about Boko Haram, because it is a current problem, it is a current situation that uh, exists in Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, and Chad, uh, and it's related to the Islamist, Islamist um, the movement in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere in the Islamic world. Uh, we have a problem with this. Uh, and the problem I would like to convey to you in closing is that this is a jihad from the perspective of the people that are involved. And we, I think we do have to understand the perspective of the people who are involved just as I've been trying to do that in relationship to these other individuals and provide the context of, of, for this entangled history. Uh, we call these people terrorists. We call what they do barbarians. Uh, they kidnap 200 girls. They enslave them. Uh, they part from all his wives. Um, they use young girls to go blow up mosques and blow up uh, markets and blow up churches. They do all kinds of things we simply don't like. And the way the terminology that goes through the, the press and the way we talk about it is they're terrorists. They're barbarians. They're terrible. They're awful. Now, I don't condone anything that's going on. But what I do want you to understand is that what we're confronting is a jihad. And that jihad is a worldwide war. And we can condemn what they do and so on. Well, they condemn what the Americans and others do in dropping bombs on schools and hospitals in Syria. And, you know, we dismiss that all as an accident. Uh, what they're doing isn't an accident. Uh, but it is a confrontation that we do have to take seriously. And I hope that in some ways, my exploration of the themes that I talk about today helps us to understand uh, more realistically what's actually going on in West Africa and in the Middle East and elsewhere, because that war, that jihad, is being taken to Europe, it's being taken to North America, it's being taken everywhere. And we have to recognize that that's the world we live in right now. We're in a, you know, a, you know, you know, in a world which has experienced a holy war from one side, uh, and some of the language from the other side, from our side, also sounds as if it's also a holy war. And somehow we have to get over that and deal with the issues that, are, that really create the conditions that, uh, that spawn this law of Thank you.